wherever we are let us carry a temple for swami with us wherever we are let us inspire two others to see us and see that this is a kind of person i would like to become that is perhaps the greatest need of the hour the need of the hour is not to ask what do we do because swami is no longer in his physical form whatever we need to do swami has already told us there is nothing new that has to be told this is the power of his touch this is the power of his word everything means so beautiful and uh, basically what he was trying to tell me is this suffering you have to undergo it is good for you in what way we won't know now perhaps when the time comes when we have to give an account of what is a good and bad and how much of karmic debt is still left in our account book maybe on that day we will realize why i had to undergo this suffering with my most loving pranams at bhagwan's lotus feet respected elders sisters and brothers of the sai family it gives me immense pleasure to stand before you today to share a few of my experiences with bhagwan yes i'll try my best to transport all of us back i said all of us because it gives me as much of joy sharing the experiences as uh, i'm hoping that you will enjoy the benefit from listening to it back in time towards those days towards a time when we remember a swami who all of us would like to see forever like that when i was approached to find out whether i would be available to give a talk on samarpan occasion i was not exactly sure whether i would be able to make it there was a crisis in the university where i was working and i was very much involved with it this was perhaps the third opportunity of invitation to present a talk for samarpan which unfortunately i was having looks like it was having as so i going to having forego it but swami made sure that things worked out and before long i was able to tell that yes i would be very happy to take part in the proceedings now when i asked exactly what would be expected to be covered during these times i was told that uh, so this is an occasion when those alumni of swami who had experienced bhagwan will share their experiences so that all of us can be transported into the realm of joy whenever i am asked to speak about an experience my first question always comes what would you classify as an experience to so, living with god is definitely an experience reading his literature and gaining new insights into his teachings is definitely another kind of experience satsang is an experience service is an experience but all of these will only remain as events unless something critical underlying is not realized i would like to explain what i meant with a small incident there was a group of devotees who had come to bhagwan's abode and after the interview and other things were over bhagwan had blessed them very copiously many of them in the group were actually given gifts by bhagwan clothes were distributed a couple of them were lucky to get even some materializations done for them and they were all in an extremely happy mood when they got into the train and they started going back to their native place in the train there was lots of discussion going on people naturally were in a very happy mood so they were discussing what was the events that inspired them made them happy at prashantinilayam and uh, before long people started telling uh, see i got vibhuti materialized from swami i was so happy and somebody showed see this ring swami gave me this ring then another person said swami gave me one safari piece you know and then he said no no this will not fit you i'm going to give you one more safari piece so like that they were busy exchanging and trading the stories and they were so happy you know and all those things they saw one very small boy seated near the window of the train who was not interested in the conversation that was going on so they asked him 
see what did Swami give you? And with a beautiful smile, that boy looked at the people and said, Bhagwan gave me darshan. What is story in the sense that, yes, service is important, satsang is important, everything else is important, but in between all that, if we do not realize that we are in the midst of a phenomena which is not likely to occur for several uh, centuries more, the very ground purpose of everything what we are experiencing goes down the drain. So it is this experience that I am trying to build, I will attempt to build and I am hoping that all of us will be transported into this kind of an experience. There are several lessons that one learns when one is at Bhagwan. And uh, the first one I would like to focus on today is perhaps what almost all of us at some stage of our involvement with Bhagwan and his mission perhaps couldn't easily relate with. And that is the way Bhagwan reads our innermost thoughts and feelings. And if you ask anyone, what is it that moves one to be so attached to Bhagwan? Yesterday I was speaking to a few of uh, our brothers and sisters. And just, just imagine this scenario wherein Bhagwan tells, every morning we'll begin with yoga and meditation. After that, we'll follow with bhajans and satsang. After that, there'll be a spiritual discourse. And after that, lights off promptly, we should have a dinner by seven and go to sleep immediately. Frankly speaking, how many of us would get attracted to this phenomena? If you analyze and see, Bhagwan never ever does anything by routine. That is because he knows that in this creation which he has made, each one of us is built with a mentality and an attitude that is unique. Bhinne bhinne matir bhinne, he says, many times he says that. And the reason he has this kind of an approach is because he knows that every one of us require a different kind of an approach. In the sense that he is able to read each one of our minds, he is able to read each one of our thoughts and act accordingly. In, during the Mahabharata days, it was said that, and basically when he is able to read that, he is able to adjust his approach accordingly. Because no one person in this creation can claim that Bhagwan is this. Because he is just not that. Because each one of us perceive him as differently, and he is actually a different personality, a different phenomena, a different experience to each one of us. And understanding and experiencing that joy, this is the key. To understand that what I call an experience, somebody else may call a transformation. It was said that once uh, an artist approached Lord Krishna's court and he said, uh, I'm an extremely famous artist. I have traveled all over the world. There is nothing that I cannot paint. Lord Krishna, I would like to paint your picture. Lord Krishna said, oh, is that so? You are such a famous artist. I am so honored to have you in my court. Very well, you may paint me. So Lord Krishna gave a pose and the artist sat and he started painting Lord Krishna. And the next day he brought a cover photograph. Everybody was eager to see what this so-called great artist would produce. And when they opened it, everyone was stunned because the person in the picture nowhere resembled Lord Krishna. The artist himself was puzzled. He said, how is it possible? This is the first time in my life I am facing this kind of a situation. He was ashamed. So I told Lord Krishna, Lord, looks like I made a mistake. Uh, please give me one more chance. I will paint you once again and bring your picture tomorrow. And this time it will look exactly like you. Lord Krishna said, please go ahead. Then again he took the whole night. This time he was very careful. Like a diksha, he almost sat. He painted the picture. Next day he got same result. This time the picture looked nowhere near Lord Krishna. This person was very puzzled. So he went back home. He was brooding over what to do. Suddenly Lord Sage Narada came. So when Sage Narada walked in, he saw this artist in a very puzzled mood. That is the parable which Swami states basically to drive home a truth. We should not start taking it figuratively. So when Sage Narada came, this artist was in a very puzzled and a very disturbed frame of mind. So Narada asked him, why, why are you so puzzled like this? And this person says, 
For so many years, I have been drawing portraits of great personalities and kings. Never have I seen such a phenomenon like this. Every time I draw a painting and take it to Lord Krishna, the painting doesn't look like Lord Krishna. There is some fault or the other. They look totally different and I just don't know what to do. And tomorrow is the last day. If tomorrow also I suffer the same fate, my reputation will be at a toss. Then Lord Narada reveals the truth to him. He says, see, whose painting are you trying to prepare? You are preparing the painting of the Lord of this universe. Can you ever capture him in a canvas? Then this artist understands what is happening and he says, but what do I do now? So, gus, 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 some whispering goes on. Lord Narada says something in his ear and this man is very happy. So, next day he goes very proudly and he is very, very elect. He is very confident because what is going to happen is definitely not what is the reputation of the past. So he goes and everybody asks, are you ready this time? Lord Krishna very smiling, he says, are you ready this time? He said, yes Lord, this time whatever painting I have got will look a carbon copy of you, exact. Then Lord Krishna says, let us see it. So they open the shawl and behind that there is a shining resplendent mirror. Lord Krishna laughs. Because this time the artist had him. Now whichever way Lord Krishna would choose to transform himself, the mirror would reflect it exactly the same way. So then Lord Krishna is very happy, he rewards the artist and he sends. Then Swami told us, you know, what is the inner meaning of this parable what I have just narrated? Your heart should be like this mirror. Do not attempt to capture the Lord into yourself. Instead, you look to purify yourself so that whatever the Lord wants, he will reflect in your heart. And definitely what the Lord wants is something that is good for us, never bad for us. So therefore, when he starts reflecting what he wants within us, we begin to learn what he wants to give. So this is the secret of what he had to look at this phenomena. That is, he can read our innermost thoughts and reflection, primarily because he himself is reflecting it there. But for that, we need to have some kind of a purification process within us. To take this a little further, it is perhaps for this very reason that Bhagwan just like I said a few minutes before, he understands each one of our problems and he tries to make sure that we learn our own lesson. In Shridi Sai Satcharita book, one could possibly read. There was a devotee who goes to Lord Shridi Sai and he says, my stomach is upset and no doctor is able to cure. And Lord Shridi Sai Baba gives him a bag full of peanuts and he says, eat this, you'll be cured. People are shocked out of their skin. Any doctor or anybody will tell you that peanuts or groundnuts is the last thing you should have when your stomach is upset. But this devotee couldn't do anything. It was the Lord himself who is giving him the medicine. So he took the peanuts. It was perfectly all right. Let us try to find a logical explanation to this. Is it the peanuts or is it the grace of the Lord that is going through the peanuts that is doing the work? For example, if another devotee would have thought, once this boy was having an upset stomach, Sai Baba gave him a bag of peanuts. I am also having an upset stomach, so same peanuts will work for me. No, it doesn't do that way. It is not the peanuts, it is the grace of the Lord that goes through the instrument that does the task. It is for this reason that I take this point a little further to say that the situation may be the same, but Bhagwan uses the same situation by reading our innermost thoughts to teach to different lessons to do different people. I used to be blessed with a few other students that whenever uh, chief minister or a president or somebody comes to Prashant Nilayam, Bhagwan used to bless uh, some of us with the opportunity to go and make sure that they are comfortable. So we had to look after their residence facilities, anything that person wanted we had to provide his meals and uh, communication between the gentleman or that lady and uh, Swami, all things we used to handle basically. Uh, this audience may recollect the ex prime minister chief minister of the united states of andhra pradesh at that time the united states of andhra pradesh the late say marri channa reddy uh, he was known to be a very strict disciplinarian and uh, he had the party firmly in his grasp because he was very strict with those who were working under him not to mention because so much of power was concentrated in him he had lots of psychophants who would all the time circumambulate him for some kind of a favor or the other and there was no shortage even in Puttaparthi. They didn't spare even a holy place like Puttaparthi. So darshan was over and the chief minister had retired inside the room. I was standing near the door 
and uh, one more uh, student brother of mine was standing near the inner door. We were just cleaning up basically. Suddenly there was a very loud knocking on the doors of Poonchandra Auditorium. In those days, Poonchandra Auditorium used to serve as a guest house for VIPs. Swami used to stay above the current bhajan hall. So we were shocked. We said, who is knocking so loudly? And we opened the door, there was uh, some MLA <coughs> who was standing there. He was very haughty. It was obvious that he had come there only to pay his respects to the chief minister. He had no respect or he had no concern that this place is a holy place and he had uh, <coughs> walked in with his chapels. So I stood near the door and I would not let him come in. So he said, move aside, very haughtily he said. I said, sir, you are wearing your chapels. Uh, if you don't mind, can you please remove your footwear and then come inside? He said, I'm talking to you, move aside. He said, and he just brushed me aside like that and he walked in, very haughty. I ran after him and I said, sir, please give me the chapels. You give me the chapels, I will keep them outside, but you can carry on if it's a problem for you. So please give me the footwear, I will take it and I will put it out. Again, he just ignored me and he walked. Now, this entire incident was being seen by the other brother who was standing near the inner door. He is a very bulky, hefty person, so he didn't budge. He just stood there like that. So this MLA came, bumped into him, said, move aside. He said, sir, please remove your chapels. He said, I'm talking to you, man. You move aside. I have to meet the chief minister. So this time the tone raised of this student also says, will you remove your chapel, sir, or shall I complain to the chief minister about your indiscipline? But that shook him. Complain to the chief minister means this person's political career is gone. Now that he couldn't risk. So promptly he went back, removed his chapels, came back, and then attended everything. Now neither of us thought it is necessary to share this with anybody. So oh, the next day the... VIP had gone, morning bhajans were going on, there was nobody in the portico. In those days, Swami used to spend lots of times in the portico. There may be about four or five of us were sitting on the upper portico and Swami was moving around up and down. And uh, ten minutes before the bhajans were due to start, this other brother who was with me was a bhajan singer. So he was sitting inside the bhajan hall. I was sitting outside the bhajan hall. So Swami came for darshan, walked up, General Chibber was sitting on the upper portico. And uh, he asked General Chibber, uh, how are you, everything? Then he said, Channa Reddy had come, he had gone, you know, he's a very great devotee of Swami. And then all that he explained to General Chibber, and General Chibber was uh, nodding. And then suddenly Swami stopped. And he said, uh, Chibber, you know, something very funny happened there. And General Chibber was interested. He said, Swami, what happened? He said, uh, some MLA misbehaved, it seems, with our boys. Then he looked at me, I was sitting right next. He said, tell what happened, you tell him. So... No, these are the moments when you have to really pause. Here is an entity, a phenomena standing in front of me who actually tapped an incident which we did not share with anybody. And here we are thinking that Swami did not know the incident unless I am going to give the details about the incident. So I started. I told this what happened, everything happened and you know, and ultimately he went away like that and this is how it ended. And Swami said, uh, but he was a little rash with you, isn't it? Why didn't you tell that? I said, yes, Swami, he was a little rash with me. What did he tell? He said, Swami, Swami he just brushed me aside and he wouldn't want to talk to me and he continued going inside. So what did you do? I said, uh, Swami, I requested him to give me his slippers. I requested him and I offered that, you know, I will keep the slippers there. He can continue going. And Swami said, see, this is my student. See the humility. They should be so humble always. And then he looked at me and he said, but Bangaru, I'll give you one advice. Every time if you are so soft and uh, silent like this, people will swallow you. You have to be a little rash and you have to stand up and you know talk brashly once in a while, otherwise you will never get your work done. I said, Swami, I will follow your advice. It didn't end there. Swami went inside the bhajan hall this time. There the other brother who sings bhajans was sitting there. So there, some more VIPs were seated, elderly gentlemen were seated and Swami went, same thing. Uh, you know, Chief Minister Chanaradi came and went recently. Yes, Swami. Those poor people had no idea that the discussion had already taken place outside. And we had no idea that Swami was repeating the drama inside. So, the, we knew that something was happening, that's all. We had said, oh Swami, yes, Chanaradi is a very great devotee of Swami. No, no, but he misbehaved with our students, you know. Then he looked at this boy who was singing bhajans, ready to sing bhajan. You tell what happened. It seems some misbehavior with some MLA took place. So, he generated the entire incident. Then Swami told, so what did you do? I said, Swami, I just stood my ground. 
I told that unless he removes his chappal, I am going to complain to Mr. Channa Reddy about his uh, uh, misbehavior. And that shook that person. He ran out and removed his chappals. So I said, see, this is my student. They know how to act at the right moment, the right way with the right people. But Bangaro, I will give you one small advice. With everybody, if you are going to be brash and very straightforward like this, you will suffer in your life. Sometimes you have to learn to be soft and polite. After bhajans were over, we traded notes and we discovered the same incident in less than 10 minutes. He had given two different lessons. Now that is what Swami is all about. And trust me, if there were another 10 people, you would have given 10 different lessons with that same incident. How does he manage this? How does he manage this? This is the characteristic feature of an avatar who can read our innermost thoughts because he is there residing in our hearts. He reflects in our heart what he wants to reflect and what he wants to know. And this is perhaps the reason why we see that he never really needs any external source to tell him what we require. What we need may not be what we actually require. There is a distinction between the two. It so happened that once Swami was uh, asking me, you know, uh, uh, these are something, you know, which are very mundane things which he discusses with you. But that's the beauty of Swami. He can stoop down to a very mundane level and then instantly transform both of us. Take us with him into a realm that perhaps we can only dream of. So this was one of those mundane discussions what we were having. So Swami saw that I had a haircut. Unfortunately, in those days, we didn't have good barbers in Puttaparthi. So if the barber does a haircut, the entire world will know. So literally, he'll shave everything or he'll do nothing. It's either a digital zero or a digital one. So unfortunately, I had suffered that day. So I came and Swami took one look at me and he said, Oh, Sunday. Sunday was incidentally a very pleasant day for us because Swami used to come down earlier than usual. So he wanted to spend time with the students and used to bless us. So he took one look at my head and he said, Oh, you went to the barber. I said, Yes, Swami. Then he said, uh, did you go to the barber or did the barber come to you? I thought for some time because these are very tricky questions which he can ask once in a while. I said, no Swami, I only went to the barber. Then he said, uh, that's good. Actually, I saw you going to the barber. So I just wanted to ask you whether you went or did he come. I, I just didn't uh, talk back. And then Swami said, this Sai Baba knows and sees everything. You know, but I don't talk. When the time comes, I use the information. Like yesterday I was telling, it looks like almost a blackmail threat to us. But the truth is not that. The truth is, when does he use this information? When he thinks it is the right time to transform us or when it's going to affect us, that is when he uses that information. And that information would have been stored in his mind for maybe years together. We would have forgotten, he doesn't forget. So, why did I tell this? It's because his sources are different. We just cannot comprehend those sources. And none of them need to be really physical. They don't belong to the conventional physical realm like we bother. One classic example is that of letters. I always used to wonder, so many letters Swami would take, so many letters Swami would take. And uh, in many of the satsangs that we participated in, this question also was asked by several devotees. You know, you are Swami's student, you let us know, see so many letters Swami takes, does he read all these letters? And there would be a satsang discussions, I've heard that sometimes in some satsangs, you know, for half an hour to 45 minutes discussions go on, on whether Swami reads all the letters. Sisters and brothers, one fundamental question we have forgotten to answer before we go into these discussions at all. I would like to start that by telling a personal incident. Those of us who finished our master's program, we used to be given accommodation in the old hostel in those days, 1990, when we finished our MSc. And uh, night was always dedicated to some kind of a satsang, wherein you know we took a voluntary decision that there would be about 14 to 15 of us who would sit in a circle at around 9 to 9.30 in the night. And some topic we would take, have a satsang and go to sleep in a very peaceful and a relaxed mind. The topic generally would revolve around personality development or, you know, spiritual topics or, you know, some discussion in the scriptures, something like that. One day the topic was, does Bhagwan read all the letters that we give? 
Now this is a topic because somebody told us, see every time we go home for vacations, you know, these devotees ask me this question. So I think we should have a discussion and find out what is happening. So okay, the discussion started, everything happened. I was one of those uh, Bezubils, Satans, who actually said, you know, it is impossible for Swami to read all the letters. I know it's only our Brahma, you know, if we think that Swami can humanly read all these letters. The basic fact, number one, does he need to read it? Number two, is he human at all? But this is the kind of mistakes we make regularly and it is just like staying with the fire, you forget in whose presence you are. So anyway, the discussion closed. It was inconclusive as was expected and uh, next morning we all went for darshan. There was a group of children who had come for Swami's darshan and in those days Swami would invariably bless them with some uh, gifts, pencils, pens, notebooks, Vibhuti Prasadam and then He would give them Padnamaskar and He would send them. And uh, I distributed it and uh, when I went to put those things back inside the bhajan, uh, inside the interview room, Swami was seated and the door was closed, which means he didn't want me to go out, he wanted me to stay there. So I just quietly I went and I parked myself near the interview room door, Swami was seated in the throne. Now this begins, starts the fun. He is a master at uh, what you would call in Indian, badka fine. Now, if he knows that somebody has a doubt or something, he will ensure, you know, that the doubt multiplies in no time until it reaches a climax and, you know, you desperately want a solution. So, last night's topic was, does Bhagwan read all the letters? So, Swami is seated there. He took out a huge pack of letters, put it in his lap. One, two, three, four. He's counting and he's throwing it aside. So I was thinking very happy, I said last night we were already discussing, you know, Swami cannot read all the letters, there he is, he has proved me right. I was patting myself on my back, then Swami stopped counting and he looked at me like this. Now, they, they, I don't, you heard this concept called as a chill down the spine. You know, some, Swami is busy reading, I was busy patting myself on the back mentally and suddenly everything stops and he stares at you like that. So I just gulped. Then Swami said, are you getting some doubts? I said, no Swami. He said, don't lie near your guru, come here. Then I went to him, then he spread out the letters like this and he said, pick up anyone. So I just picked up a random, normal, white envelope. Then Swami said, open it. I said, Swami, it's a letter for you, how can I open? Then he said, see, I'm telling you, you open it. I opened it, then he said, go back to that corner. Then I went back and he said, read what is there in there, read it to yourself, don't read it aloud. It was a normal white paper. So I just read, it was a letter from a devotee in Calcutta whose son had some mental problem, mental issues and Swami had told that gentleman not to go to any doctor and just by pure power of vibhuti which he sent in regular doses to that devotee, Swami cured that boy. That boy was now in his engineering final year and he was graduating with top honours. So because of that, this father was so proud and so happy that he had given a thanksgiving letter to Swami saying that, Swami, because of your grace, is fine. You will not believe it, sisters and brothers. He sat there on the chair and he repeated verbatim what is there in that letter. It's a normal sealed white envelope. It's a normal white paper. It's a normal pen ink. Out of the thousands of letters, he knew what is there in that. That is when the realization hit me. Why are we wasting so much of time discussing? Does he have time to read all these letters? The fundamental truth, he doesn't need a letter in the first place. He knows. He already knows. So why do we write a letter? We had the good fortune of asking Swami once. So I recollected this incident and I told Swami, after that, I still wonder why is it that we write letters? Then Swami told a very interesting thing. He said, so what happens to you when you write that letter? I said, Swami, I feel like I'm almost talking to you. He said, it is for that feeling that you write the letter. It is to respect that feeling that I take the letter. Nothing more than that. Not because I don't know, it's because I see the feeling with which you have written the letter. That is the weightage I give the letter and that's why I take it or I don't take it. Not because I need to know what is happening. So this is a fantastic concept and that is the last time I ever associated a letter being important to make Swami aware of something. One afternoon, Dr. Gangadhar Shastri uh, he is a professor in economics at uh, our university and a very good friend and a mentor for all of us, many of us. One afternoon he came and he told, uh, Sainat, there is a letter I have to give to Swami. Can you ask Swami whether I can give it? So I went and I said, Swami, Gangadhar Shastri has come. He would like to give a letter. 
Swami said, get it. Just as he was about to go, he called me back and he told, see, it is about his brother-in-law's dog in Korea. He had a dog. That dog was so dear to the family that it was almost like a family member. That dog has passed away. So that brother-in-law of Gangadhar Shastri wants to know whether he can do anadanam in the memory of the dog. A dog or a man is a life form and anadanam is any day a noble task. Tell him they can definitely do the anadanam. There is no, what you call, uh, uh, it's not against the scriptures or it is not that they are going to commit any sin. I said, fine. The natural assumption here is Dr. Gangadhar Shastri has already told Swami and Swami is aware of what is happening. So I went and I just told Dr. Gangadhar Shastri, Sir, Swami said you can do. And I started coming back. He said, hey, come here. So I went back. What happened? So what can I do? I said, I don't know. You have told Swami something. Swami has said you can do it. He said, uh, then he just stared at me like that. Did Swami really say that? I said, Sir, obviously. That's why I'm carrying that message to you. Then he told Sainath, I have to tell you something. You have just witnessed a stupendous miracle. This brother-in-law of his had rung up just about less than an hour back telling him that the dog had died. He had rung him up from Korea. And he wanted Dr. Gangadhar Shastri to find out from Swami about this. There was no earthly source of Swami finding out about the dog's death. He not only knew, he also gave the answer. Now, this is the way in which he used to give a ready indication at every point of time that he knew how to respond and he didn't need any of the earthly sources to know what he wanted to know. It is perhaps for this very reason that uh, he always used to say, my language is the language of the heart. My language is the language of the heart. We just saw a video of uh, the Dasara celebrations. Uh, during Dasara celebrations, the Prashanti Vidwan Mahasabha, which uh, I was introduced as one of the regular speakers, uh, yes, Swami did bless me with that chance and for several decades I used to be a member of that happy group. In 1985, when I first joined the institution, for a few years before 1985, this Prashanti Vidwan Mahasabha had been put on hold for some reason. And Swami wanted to revive it for the 60th birthday which was there in 1985. So, he selected a group of students, there were about uh, 11 or 12 of us and uh, one day he asked the registrar, the then registrar Mr. Chakravarti to call all of us for an interview. We went at 4 o'clock and the interview lasted till 6.20. Bhajans were from 6 to 6.30 in those days. So, when this interview was going on, Swami indicated that he wanted this Prashanti Vidwan Mahasabha to be revived and as we were going, for that interview. Swami used to actually spend lots of time in the veranda in those days. There were only 300 and 350 and odd students in those days. And you know, all of us would comfortably fit in the upper portico. And all the VIPs were strictly instructed to sit only in the topmost portico. None of them could sit below. Mr. Khayaldas was there in those days. He used to be very strict with his rule. Anybody used to come and sit here, used to tell, sorry, please go up. This place is meant for students. So all of us used to comfortably fit in that upper portico, just opposite the bhajan door. And uh, Swami would sometimes spend hours and hours just standing there and talking impromptu, totally, and you know, to students over there. And uh, some of these students who were from North India, they used to feel a little these things. See, Swami is always talking in Telugu, you know, we are not able to understand. And uh, one of the boys who was in this group selected for the interview, he was just telling three, four of us, you people are so lucky, you know, you know Swami's language. You can understand what he is trying to tell you. You know, two, three times he was telling, see, Swami's language you are able to understand, you know, how I wish even I knew Telugu, I could also understand what Swami is saying. Then the interview was going on and in the interview, I still remember, Swami materialized a huge uh, laddu for all of us. Mr. Mayur Pandya, Mr. Dr. Sundar Iyer, they were all there in that uh, group. And uh, he waved his hand and materialized a huge laddu. And he said, straight from Kailash, pure kauki. You know, it's like that market pitch you make, you know, when trying to dispatch a laddu to the buyer. And then he crushed it and he was looking around. So immediately... This boy who was sitting in the front, who made that comment, I wish I knew Swami's language, he put his hand out like this. 
Swami put all the laddu in his hand and from there he told all of us, come. And from there he started distributing one piece, little bit, little bit to everyone. While he was distributing, we were all witness to this, that's why I can vouch for it. He looked at this boy and he said, Bangaru, just out of the blue, it made, made no context to accept to the three of us. He said, Bangaru, my language is the language of the heart, not Telugu. The rest of nobody understood what Swami was trying to tell, we three understood. This discussion was red hot in the sense that it had just taja taja they say. As we were entering the hall, we, this discussion had taken place. Here was Swami who already knew what, who said what. These are stupendous experiences in the sense that you really begin to realize that you are in the presence of a great phenomena. It's an experience you have to feel here, not listen here and not see here. So it is this reason why when he says that my language is a language of the heart, he responds in a way in which the devotee can appreciate. That is perhaps the reason why he always used to say, your heart is a single seat so far. You either have the world there or you have God there. You cannot have both of us there. And when we place our explicit trust in Bhagwan and we say, you are our only refuge, he always reacts. I remember a devotee in Hyderabad who actually was narrating this experience of his. Uh, his daughter had to get married and uh, after great difficulty, a good match was uh, obtained. And Swami told him, don't worry, everything will be fine. I'm going to be there. I'm going to help you perform the wedding. Don't worry, everything will be fine. And true enough, the groom side family was very nice. They, they didn't create much of a trouble. The only request they had was, all of us would like to go to Tirupati to have Lord Balaji's darshan. Please arrange for that. After the wedding, we will leave. Now, after the wedding, it so happened that there was a fierce rain. Plenty of rain was there and, you know, not a single cab was available. So, this devotee's friend had an old car, which he said, I'll get that repaired, you go in that car. So, they repaired that car. They went, had darshan and when they were coming back, in the dense forest ghat section, the car broke down. Now, there were kids and ladies and elderly people in the car, about five, six of them, they didn't know what to do. And uh, soon enough, they were pray this gentleman was praying to Swami and uh, three of these uh, trucks, we know these trucks, you know, with only the engine, no chassis. They are going for bodybuilding basically. So three of those trucks came along with three drivers and they stopped and they said, what happened? So the problem was explained. And uh, those people dug out their spares, repaired the car and then they said, this is very dark and notorious for decoities and robberies. You please put the car in between the trucks, we will escort you till you leave that guard section. So they safely escorted the family out of the guard section and there this devotee was so pleased, he offered them money. They said, no, it is okay. You are like our, you know, our own family members, we just did what we could. Then this was, uh, devotee said, at least have a cup of coffee with us, please have a cup of tea with us. They said, no, no, we are in a hurry, we have to go and all three of them took off. A few days later when this gentleman came to Prashant and Layam, Swami suddenly summoned him inside the interview room. There was one devotee inside with Swami already, one Mr. Desikachari, and he was in a very depressed mood. So Swami wanted to boost him with some experiences, so he called the other devotee inside. And he said, talk to him, he is in a very depressed mood. Now, these are things, you know, which you really cannot explain. Swami is sitting there and you want us to alleviate somebody's depression, but doesn't matter, it's an order. So, he started telling everything, story, this, that, that, this, Swami patiently heard for some time and he said, Tirupati, what happened to Tirupati? So, this gentleman said, Haan, Tirupati. He said and he started talking to Mr. Desikachari, you know, Swami helped us like this, we went to Tirupati, we had a very good darshan and we came back, Swami patiently heard, he said, you are not telling the actual thing why I called you. I said, Swami, I told everything as it is. He said, you didn't talk about the three truck drivers. Then he said, uh, yes, uh, then he told like this. Then he said, then Swami told Desikachari, look at this fellow, Somberi. He is forgetting the actual thing, what happened. He even offered me money and a cup of tea and now he is forgetting to tell that very thing to you. This devotee just fell at Swami's feet. So, sometimes these things hit us with such a shock. That, you know, it takes us some time to comprehend what is happening. Nevertheless, these are the kind of things they leave an indelible impression in our heart and convince us what is happening actually to us. Having said so far, I would like to spend a little time in talking about what we call as surrender. 
Many of us have different conceptions about what we can call possibly as surrender. I'm not going to really go deep into philosophy and call about surrender of the type of Meera and Radha and all these people. Frankly, I'm not qualified to talk about that. However, I can share some experiences and understandings that I've had during our stay with Swami about what actually surrender can possibly mean. And possibly we can try to make sure that we enhance our own spiritual exercise to make sure that we reach that level. One small story which Swami used to narrate. There was a scholar who was very well versed in the Advaita philosophy. Bhagavad Gita he knew inside out. Any passage you could ask him, he will know how to answer or explain it. Everything he knew very well. So the king was very pleased with him and he presented him with a very rich and expensive robe. The scholar was very proud of that robe. He would parade it wherever he went and he was you know, very possessive about the robe. So one day when he had, and he would not give it to any washerman. He would wash it himself because he didn't want any washerman to touch that robe. So one day he washed that robe and hung it and the wind blew the robe away and made it land on a washerman. That washerman said, this is my chance. He grabbed the robe and he started running away. This scholar ran after him, caught him and before long they were hitting each other, you know, pulverizing each other and raining blows on each other. But in between the scholar didn't forget to shout, Oh Lord Narayana, save me. In Vaikuntha, meanwhile, Mother Lakshmi saw Lord Narayana rise and run towards the door. But he reached the door and again came back. After a few minutes, again he got up, went to the door, again he came back. So Mother Lakshmi was watching these things, she couldn't contain her curiosity and she asked Lord Vishnu, why are you repeatedly going till the door and coming back? If you have to go to save somebody, why don't you go? Then he says, I would love to go. But the problem is that scholar is shouting, oh Lord Narayana, save me. But in between he is also hitting the washerman. So if he is capable of taking care of himself, why should I go? It's like that incident once again of Draupadi when the Vastraparan was going on, Draupadi was shouting, Oh Vaikuntha Vasi, Krishna save me. No Krishna. Oh Vrindavana Vasi, Sanchari, Krishna save me. Still no Krishna. Oh Mathurani Vasi, Krishna, still so no Krishna. Yashodhanandana Krishna, still no Krishna. Finally she's so tired, she says, Oh Hridayani Vasi, Krishna, Krishna appears in a trice. So later on it seems Draupadi has a chance to ask Lord Krishna, why is it that you made me wait for such a long time? And Lord Krishna says, See, what do you want me to do? I am sitting in your heart and you are telling me Vaikuntha Vasi. So I have to go all the way to Vaikuntha and come. Vrindavana Sanchari, I have to go to Vrindavan and come. Mathura Nivasi, I have to go to Mathura and come. So you are only sending me, I am taking time. Of course it is a very... Uh, Let's not analyze it in the conventional sense. What do you mean by the Lord has to go and come? That's not what is being hinted here. The truth is something far deeper that Swami was trying to tell us by the virtue of this story. And that is, always look at the Lord being with us. Not, you know, being in some Puttaparthi or Vrindavan or Kodaikanal or Uti or something. Wherever we are going, the Lord goes with us. At a later stage, Swami actually made it even more deep. He said, if you say the Lord is within you, you are a bigger picture than the Lord. You should say, I am within the Lord. So wherever I go, I cannot go beyond Him. He said, that is the feeling you have to carry at all times. So it is for this reason that, but at the same time, He has given a funny concept to all of us human beings and that is called as a free will. There were several illuminated discussions about this free will. I remember Prashanti Vidwan Mahasabhas where Swami actually once talked about this concept of free will. So the, when we were discussing inside about this free will, Swami said there is actually nothing called free will. Free will is a kind of hallucination that God gives you. I said, Swami, why should he do that? So then he said, when you discharge your karma, as long as you feel that I am doing this, I have to meet this end, I have to meet this goal, that is free will. That means, it is I who I am doing, I have to get this result, I have to do this. On the other hand, if you say, I am only an instrument, God is going to do it, He is the one who will decide the result, free will ends there. So he said, as long as you do it with the feeling of I, me and myself, at that point of time, this free will operates in the sense that whatever you do, you have to bear the consequence. 
the day you say it is not me it is god the free will disappears whatever is the consequence god takes it so therefore this concept of free will and bhagwan used to give enormous respect to this free will all avatars were like that they never infringed in that free will concept this also once i remember mr v k narsimhan the late sri v k narsimhan once asked swami swami why is it that you do not tell people that there is no free will so that it helps them to understand and adapt to the concept of surrender faster and swami said free will is perhaps the last obstacle on the path to salvation and if it is happening because some guru is forcing it down your throat it is never going to be permanent it is a sadhana which the sadhaka has to do to understand and destroy that feeling on his or her own no guru is going to help him do that and should not also so it so happened that but he does everything to ensure that as long as that devotion is there even when the so called free will is operating he still respects that mr top john mayer who the danish devotee of uh, bhagwan he was speaking to the students in the foyer one day and during the speech he happened to narrate this small incident it was during the onam time and uh, mr top john mayer's son developed an extremely high temperature so he was rushed to the hospital and there uh, of course he was treated and he was brought back and swami came to know about it and he asked mr mayer why did you take him to the hospital i am here you could have come to me and mr mayer said uh, swami you had retired to your room so i had to go to the hospital but anyway that hospital also only you only have built it and swami said mayer i built that hospital for those who trust the medicine for those who trust me i am here so is not that if you go to the hospital the cure won't take place the doctor and the medicine who is there if you say this is for swami swami comes through them also to cure us but the route selected is different either direct or indirect indirect obviously takes time direct is the fastest so it is up to us so it's not that that route is not going to work if that is the case swami would never have built the super specialty hospital swami would never have built the institutions he would not have sent out so many batches and batches of students and doctors so what is being hinted here is that you select the direct route one to one or you select the indirect route both ways it is the same lord who is going to respond the one of uh, i wouldn't know whether to call it a funny incident an illuminating incident or whether it is an outstanding incident what it is perhaps you can judge for yourself after listening to what i have to say many of uh, especially the senior devotees here will recognize mr vacha mr vacha uh he was a uh, stores he used to look after the general stores at prashant and lem a uh, bent uh, gentleman one of the most uh, humble devotee of bhagwan that uh, one ever has a good fortune of interacting with there is so much to learn from that gentleman so he once told us about uh, this uh, incident he used to go to anantapur in a matador van for making purchases for the general stores once in a week the route was you inform mr kutumbarao mr kutumbarao tells bhagwan and then they take the matador go to anantapur pick up the supplies and you come back so it so happened that one day this matador met with a severe accident and mr vacha was uh, fractured on his leg so he was admitted in a hospital at anantapur itself so swami sent uh, mr kutumbarao to find out how mr vacha is so mr kutumbara came he told mr vacha swami has sent you some prasadam he wanted to know how you are mr vacha was very thrilled he said uh, kutumbara sir i'll give you one letter can you please pass it on to swami he said sure please write so he wrote a very small letter and which one word he mentioned was uh, swami it is because of your grace that i got saved and i am so touched that you know you have sent prasadam and you are inquiring about me uh, at this point of time you are the only savior you are the only doctor i can trust what uh, please save me He sent the letter. Swami read the letter, and about a week later, he was discharged. So he went to Puttaparthi. Ten, fifteen days down the line was Dasara, and Mr. Vacha badly wanted to be able to walk in those fifteen days. However, the orthopedic surgeon who performed the surgery said there is no chance of you walking for at least one more month. So Mr. Vacha was very disturbed. So he didn't know what to do. So darshan was going on, and Swami came. Mr. Vacha was uh, there on the wheelchair. swami came and said ha vacha when did you come said swami i was discharged yesterday 
uh, your leg is healing what did the doctor say said, swami doctor say that another one more month before i can start walking he said good you'll get better don't worry and swami went away but but he, mr vachas said swami should have known that i was very eager to attend the dasara celebrations why is he saying good so everything was over next day he was sitting for darshan again during darshan round swami comes to him and he said ah vacha what did the doctor say when did i realize your leg going to get better and i said swami one month swami said fine and swami went away third day again he comes and says vacha when is your leg going to get better what are the doctor saying he said swami one month but this time mr vacha was starting to get puzzled he said why every day he is coming and asking me the same question even people around mr vacha started wondering about it then he went away that night mr vacha started discussing with his wife he needed a third party intervention so he asked his wife i am not able to understand this phenomena every day he is coming and asking me the same question what are the doctor saying when are you going to walk then his wife thought for some time thought for some time then she said uh, you told me that you wrote a letter to swami while you were in hospital he said yeah i wrote what did you write in that he said uh, i wrote like this i wrote like this and then the last sentence was swami you are my doctor whatever you says will happen then his wife said there's your answer tomorrow when he asks you tell him this so next day when he was seated there swami came and he asked what watcha what are the doctors saying swami caught hold he caught hold of swami's hand said swami you are my doctor whenever you say i will walk i will walk then swami said then why are you repeatedly quoting that doctor other doctors kai ko usko bulata hai hamesha main hu na idhar then he said you will walk in one week flat and mr watcha conveyed that message to the orthopedic doctor he said impossible you cannot walk in one week trust me swami made him walk in one week he attended the dasara festival and mr watcha got that prokshan what we saw which is the cherished boon which every devotee desires during the dasara festival he did it and i was very happy because mr watcha himself told me this incident one day and swami was not there we used to spend lots of time at the stores you know mr watcha had a huge wealth of such experiences so he narrated this to us that is what surrender is all about anasekam vachasekam karmanyekam swami aims for that the day that we do with him his response is instantaneous during some of the satsangs some questions were asked and i believe some devotees also asked swami uh swami why is it that when we surrender to you why do we still suffer why do we have to suffer in fact uh, to the contrary we notice that many devotees who are closest to devotees of bhagwan who have implicit faith in bhagwan they seem to be getting the worst share in this society of all kind of brickbats and suffering so this question was once even asked of uh, swami and uh, one day i even asked swami i said one statement swami made in a discourse i said i couldn't understand he said what is it i'll tell it in telugu then i'll translate it into english what he said was puttina baadha povalante pettina baadha pattali puttina baadha means it's a pain that is born with you that is our karma our prarabdha karma it is born with us that is puttina baadha it is born with us pettina baadha padali you have to undergo the pain that you suffer in this world because that is the only cure for the karma so it's a, some kind of a karmic discharge of debt some kind of a karmic discharge so when uh, one of these days we were having a discussion with swami i said swami i didn't understand this so can you please explain it a little further there were three four of us students there and swami said see it is something like a painful surgery something is wrong with you unless you undergo a painful surgery for the rest of the life you are going to continue to suffer so better to suffer a small surgery so that for the rest of your life you will be happy so this pain is therefore essential it is good for you if you undergo this pain you will be happy in the future so i asked swami swami if it is good for us why is it that we do not accept it easily and swami said have you any idea how difficult it is to accept anything that is good when you try to develop a good habit and retain it the difficulty level is very high compared to picking up and retaining a bad habit so some said it's inherent tendency of men that when anything good is trying to be given they resist it and make things difficult because they look at a short term gain not at the long term gain 
So then Swami said that and I said, uh, but Swami, if he surrendered to you, isn't it going to make it easy, this suffering what we are undergoing? Swami caught our ears and he boxed it and he said, you foolish fellow, that is the biggest difficulty, surrendering to God. He said, why, why do you think somebody will surrender to God, stepping aside his entire ego? If that happens, you will not view this as a suffering at all. The question of suffering doesn't arise at all. Until you keep thinking that this is a suffering which I have to get rid of, this is going to continue. The day you say this is a gift from God, I surrendered it to God, you will no longer see it as a suffering at all. It is going to be more of a gift which God has given us. So basically, therefore, the truth here is, Bhagavan very clearly said, some small pains will always be there in your life. Think of Swami at that time. Think of Swami. You have to undergo that pain. That is why he is giving it to you. But if you pray to him, he will find a way to ensure that you do not suffer it for a large duration. So this discussion, once again, uh, Mr. G. V. Subharao was having with Swami. And Swami, he said, you are saying that if Swami's grace is there, Lord's gift is there, he can avoid the karma. Swami said, I never said that. No God's grace will make you get rid of your karma, that you have to suffer. However, when you surrender to God, instead of getting 20 blows, God will finish it in just two blows. Then I said, Swami, but that looks like you have reduced the karma. Swami said, that is not how it should be looked at. You will still get the 20 blows, but it will look like as if you have got only two blows. That is the power of God's grace and surrender to Him. So therefore, whatever pains we have to suffer, it will continue. You cannot expect instant cure because Swami will never do it. Because He sees the longer term. We were uh, there in the cricket team. Some of my friends, uh, my brothers sitting here were also a part of that team. And uh, we used to play cricket. And uh, the ground used to be very uneven in those days. We didn't have that beautiful ground which we see today. So it was not... Uh, unnatural for a cricket ball to take off suddenly at an odd angle and hit somebody. So I was practicing on a mat and one of the most fearsome bowlers in our team, one Mr. Hariharan was bowling at the other side. As it is, he used to bowl very fearsome and on that day, unfortunately, the ball landed on a small pebble under the cricket mat and it took off at an odd angle. And uh, But for some reason, I saw two cricket balls and two Hariharans instead of one Hariharan and one cricket ball. I didn't know what to do. So I just turned my head like that and with a sickening thud, the ball landed at the back of my head. No helmets in those days. So I just collapsed on the wicket like that. Everybody came running. They said, they called my name, Sainath, Sainath, wake up, wake up, wake up. They put some water. I got up. Then I went and I sat. Uh, somehow I recovered. But from that day onwards, I started getting double vision. Every morning, I would see two of my classmates I used to get, I was a room leader, so it was my duty to wake up the students. So I used to wake up, I didn't know whom to wake up, there were two people there. So somehow with great difficulty I would wake up everybody, I couldn't walk because you know it is early in the morning and the double vision was most highest at that point of time. It used to reduce gradually over the day, so I would sit in the room itself and finish my suprabhatam. Room leaders in those days would get interviews with Swami, something which we used to look forward to. And Swami used to, there are few photographs we have also of the room leader sitting with Swami and you know Swami is spending lots of time with us. And during one of those interviews, Swami was telling us, see room leaders should set an example. You should get up first in the morning and you should wake up your roommates and send them to Suprabhatam and all these things. And then he said, but unfortunately some of room leaders are not going for Suprabhatam nowadays. So we were all sitting wondering what to do and Swami said, take this Sainath for example, he is not going for uh, Suprabhatam for the last one week. So we were just looking and everybody was looking at me, you know, what a shameful thing to do. Then Swami came to my rescue and said, but it is not his fault. Now please notice one thing, this double vision is something which is very serious, you don't discuss it with everybody. I didn't discuss it with anyone. I didn't tell my parents, I didn't tell my warden, I didn't tell Swami, nobody. But Swami knew. So he said, it is not his fault. You know, he is seeing two of everything off late. And that is why he is sitting in his room and finishing his uh, Suprabhatam. Am I right or wrong? He said. I said, Swami, yes. Then Swami said, come here. 
So when I went, that photograph is still there. When we were having our uh, photograph with Swami, Swami's hand was at the back of my head and he was looking at my head when that photograph was taken. I still have that photograph with me. And all of us were not aware because Swami was you know, behind all of us and he was laughing. All of us were smiling, but Swami's hand was at the back of my head. That photograph is still with me. And Swami said, don't worry, everything will be fine. Don't worry about it. Two days after that, some kind of a growth started coming up here. And I had excruciating pain. And that growth, after a few days, it burst. I went to Dr. Alreja. So they did some little bit of mini surgery while I howled my head out. And uh, they put a big bandage here. It looked like I was wearing a flower at the back. Everybody was poking fun at me, except the one person whom I wanted to speak, Swami. He was royally ignoring me. So I would sit like this when darshan is going on, so that when Swami is coming this side, he can see, and Swami would turn the other side and go for darshan. And when he is coming this side, I will get up and give a letter. Swami said, ha, kabaya, like that he will bend and he will ask the person behind me. I was conveniently ignored for about 10 days. I finally got the message. I said, see, he is the one who cured me. What am I trying to tell him? Let it be, he will only decide when he wants to know about it and I let it go. And uh, sure enough, after that, when the thing reduced, he said, you will be perfectly fine. Inka double vision adi e mundad bangaru, ni kantha baane untundi, he said. Just to be on the safe side, I also got an EEG done once I went home for vacations. Nothing was there, everything was fine. In fact, the doctor said there is nothing in his head. So, th th this is the power of his touch. This is the power of his word. Everything means so beautiful. And uh, basically what he was trying to tell me is, this suffering you have to undergo, it is good for you. In what way, we won't know now. Perhaps when the time comes when we have to give an account of what is a good and bad and how much of karmic depth is still left in our account book, maybe on that day we will realize why I had to undergo this suffering. When we actually surrender to Swami and we surrender to God, He steps in, just now like we said, instead of getting 20 blows, it looks like as if only two blows had fallen. Father was in the railways and he had a boss, you know, who was actually a very nice man. But you know, every time my father would tell him that, sir, I'm going to Puttaparthi for darshan, he would uh, tell, so, how is your Sai Baba? Whenever he comes back from darshan and gives him a Vibhuti packet, he says, so, how is your Sai Baba? Again. So, so father used to just keep quiet, he wouldn't say anything. And a uh, few months later, this boss called my father in, he was a very worried man, he was looking very worried. And he said, uh, uh, Rao sahab, I need some help from you. He said, sir, what is the problem? He said, see, I have been transferred to Calcutta. Now, Calcutta is like telling, uh, boss, you are transferred to the jail. Uh, in railways, Calcutta was, I am sorry if uh, anybody is from Calcutta, my intention is not to hurt you. As far as railways is concerned, Calcutta was a horrible place to work. So, uh, lots of labor trouble and you know, they wouldn't uh, tolerate officers with respect and uh, every kind of conceivable. Nobody wanted to go to Calcutta basically. And this gentleman was transferred to Calcutta. So, he said, see, they have transferred me to Calcutta and you know, I don't want to go there. Uh, then he was very embarrassed for some time. He didn't know how to tell it. I finally burst and said, do you think your Sai Baba can help me? Then father said, sir, that is up to him. But if you want, I will take you. Let's go for his darshan and let us see what happens. You pray to him, sir, and accept whatever he is ready to give you. If you go with that feeling, he will definitely do something that's good for you. He, then he thought for a couple of days and then one day he called my father and he said, Rao sahab, let's go to Puttaparthi. I want to have Baba's darshan. By this time, you know, he had also decided, see, he is my last hope. Bus, whatever he decides, I will accept it. Let us go and have his darshan. So he went for darshan and they sat for the lines and uh, Swami came out for darshan and called him straight away. And he went for darshan and after he came out, he, he was in a daze, absolute daze. Now, he was not speaking normally, he was not looking normal. And then when they were sitting in their vehicle and they were going back to Dharmavaram, where they were supposed to board a train, finally the boss spoke. He said, Rao sahab, did you tell Swami anything about me? I said, sir, then Mr. my father said, sir, Swami doesn't talk to me. There is no way I can tell him what is happening. Then he said, uh, you know what he said the moment I walked into the interview room? My father said, no. He looked at me, put his hand on my shoulder and said, so how do you like your Sai Baba? That is a question he used to bully my father with every time. Swami gave it back to him in kind. 
So he said, how do you like your Sai Baba? That is it. That man just crumbled there because by this time he knew that he was in the presence of a great phenomena. And then Swami spoke to him and he said, see, you go. It is a government's order. You have to go there for some time. Go there, but in eight months I will get you transferred from there. You will come back to your parent state. But of course, Swami gave that gentleman so much of love in the interview room that, you know, he didn't really care, you know, what Swami was telling. He was so overwhelmed in that love. But when he came out, he started analyzing. Logic started kicking in. And he said, uh, Calcutta is like, you know, Andaman and Nicobar banishment. You know, you go there, you can't come out so easily. But Swami told me, you're going to get transferred in eight months' time. Um, it must be to, just to please me, yeah. I was in a very unhappy mood, you know, just to console me, he must have told, I cannot come back in eight months. In six months, he got transferred back. And the first thing he did was, he went to Puttaparthi to thank Swami. The power of Swami's word. Power of Swami's word is uh, that, in the sense that it is no different from him at all. Sometimes Swami used to keep telling us, Satya Sai Baba is no different from his word. The weightage and the respect you give Satya Sai Baba in this form, that is the weightage I expect you to give to his words. What happens when we do not give that weightage to his words? Of course we suffer. But something far deeper than this happens. In three sessions one day when we were all uh, sitting, there was one uh, very elderly lady devotee. She was very happy. She came to Swami and she said, Swami, thanks to your grace, uh, my son has completed his education. He is going abroad for higher studies. It is all your grace. And Swami just kept quiet. Then she added, Swami, he was your student. Implying that she was a student of Satsai University. Swami looked at her in a start and he said, he was not my student. All of us were stunned. The warden was stunned. Because all of us knew that that boy had indeed studied in the university at the Brindavan campus. Then uh, Swami looked at one elderly gentleman there and he said, but Swami, he studied in this college. I saw him. Then Swami said, no, he is not my student. That is the first time I heard Swami tell who actually is a student. He said, see, when you come and join the university, you participate in the curriculum prescribed by the university. You write the exams that the university prescribes. You get the grade that the university prescribes. Once you satisfy all these three with the right amount of attendance, then the university gives you a degree saying that so and so has been the student of this university and he has graduated. Until then, you cannot be called as a student of that university. Like that even I have some tests, I also have some requirements. Unless you satisfy that, I will never give you the stamp of my student. An impression that lasted with me forever. So who we think is Swami's student sitting there with Swami and studying in his university is not exactly need not be Swami's student. Somebody who is sitting kilometers and kilometers away who is actually not studying in the university can actually be Swami's student. The reason for that is who follows my words? Who gives that respect to my words? Who gives the same weightage to my words as they give to this physical form? They are my real students. And his word is indeed so powerful because it can work wonders. 21st November 1995. 21st November 1995, birthday celebrations are on in full swing. And uh, you very well know that dramas and the programs would take place at the Purnachandra Auditorium where Swami used to come out. He was staying in Purnachandra Auditorium in those days. So he would come out, participate and see the dramas. And while the artists were changing, like one country would finish their drama and the other country would start, Swami would come back inside and spend some time with uh, us and a few elderly devotees who would be waiting there. Now the Greek devotees had finished their drama and the German devotees were scheduled to do their drama. So Swami wanted to distribute some clothes to them. So brother Dilip and myself, we came backstage and we were removing the clothes when suddenly somebody knocked on the door from the other side. So we opened Mr. Hira. You all know who Mr. Hira is from Japan. So he was standing there looking very worried and with him was one elderly Japanese lady. And he said, uh, we are in a problem. One elderly Japanese lady had suffered a stroke. She's hemorrhaging badly from inside and losing her blood. Uh, no, and she's already gone into a coma and her left side of the body is already paralyzed and uh, you know uh, there is nobody here with her so we want to know what to do should we send word to her people at Japan because it will take some time for them to come here 
and there was an international panel of doctors who was actually participating in a medical camp at that point of time. They had all examined her unanimous in their conclusion, she is not going to survive the night. So they said we need Swami's direction. One of the things which we can do is a last hope is we have to send word to Japan and second is we have to put her in an ambulance and send her to Bangalore. We cannot do anything over here. So we said we'll tell Swami when Swami comes. So Swami when he came backstage, I explained to Swami. I said Swami like this, Mr. Hira has come like this. Swami heard me very patiently, he heard me. And then he said, just looked at me very absently, he was very distracted for some reason. And looked at me and said, she's going to be fine. But anyway, you tell the doctors to do what they have to do. It's almost like, you know, sorry, you suddenly noticed I'm divine, don't notice that. He was a master at that. You know, he used to be very careful about how we used to mask his divinity. For some strange reason, he would never want us to, you know, experience that direct true divinity. It's always an indirect form with him. So then he said, no, 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 you tell the doctors to do whatever they have to do. Then he went, he went back. So I went and told Mr. Hira. So he said, everything boils down to what Swami has to say. So the next morning they went. and uh, the, Swami left a little early to Darshan the next day. And there he gave some vibhuti and he said, you give that vibhuti to that lady. So they put it in that IV fluid or what it is, I am not very clear about that. But the vibhuti were administ- administered to the lady. Six o'clock in the evening, I saw Dr. Bhagavat standing near the Purnachandra Auditorium door. He was thrilled. His face was very lit up. He was the medical superintendent of the general hospital. He said, Are bhai, a big miracle hua hai bhai, hospital mein. So, we wanted to know what it is. He said, see, wo Japanese lady, she was supposed to pass away. She's sitting up and having idlis. No paralysis. And you know, I have to tell this to Swami. So, we said, okay, then uh, we'll tell Swami. And when Swami is Mr. Indula Shah, Madras Srinivasan and all these trust members and all were seated around Swami. So, I stood near the door and Swami saw me and said, what happened? I said, Swami, Dr. Bhagavat has come. It seems that Japanese lady who was in a coma yesterday, she's perfectly fine, she's having idlis in the hospital. And Swami said, I told you yesterday, you unnecessarily killed a living lady. Because I was telling Swami, you know, I was telling Dilip and others, what is this Swami is doing here? This lady is going to be critical, you know, night if she dies, you know, we are going to have serious trouble and all those things I was talking. So, and he said, you unnecessarily are killing a living lady. So, I just shut my mouth, I didn't know what to do and uh, Swami went actually later and he spoke to that lady. That is the power of his words. Many a time what happens is these words don't come straight. For some reason, he always wants us to exercise our buddhi to understand what he is actually telling us. Very rarely will he give direct answers. And one particular experience which uh, actually those who heard it called this experience of mine as what is called as an electrifying experience. I do not know if uh, some people in this audience, especially my student alumni brothers, would have definitely heard about it. Uh, this is in 91, 92, ni- sorry, 94, 95 when the hospital was being built. Lots of chandeliers were coming from all over the world. And you know, Swami used to see these chandeliers and decide which chandelier has to be put where. So we had a very excellent mechanism of building them. Swami used to actually have that chandelier assembled, lit and then he used to decide where the chandelier has to go. So we had something like a tent, two wooden poles like this and another two wooden poles like this with a wooden pole in the center about seven to eight feet above the ground. And we used to hang the central stem of the chandelier from that wooden pole and start building the chandelier all around it. I I don't know whether I am conveyed the mechanism. So, this chandelier arrived at 7 o'clock at night. That was the time when Swami would retire to his room. So, Dilip and me saw the chandelier and we said, Are bhai, if we start assembling this now, Swami will get delayed unnecessarily. We'll do one thing, we'll assemble it overnight and tomorrow morning when he's going for darshan, we'll show it to him. So, we just zipped across uh, the hall and we put it in the Poonchandra stage with the intention of building it tomorrow. Swami's sharp eye caught the movement. They said, come here, what happened? He said, uh, Swami, chandelier has come. Assemble it, we'll see. Then we just kept quiet. We said, uh, but Swami understands the thought behind the process and he said, it's getting late for me, that's why. We said, yes, Swami. So don't worry, I'll wait for 10 minutes. You sit and assemble it. So we started removing the chandelier. Then I got a brainwave. 
I said, see, why wait for a rope to hang it and all that? This is a very small chandelier. I will hold the stem in my hand. Uh, you uh, assemble the chandelier. So Dilip liked the idea very much. He said, yeah, hold it. I'll do it. So I was holding this in my hand. He started assembling it. Five minutes later, Swami came and he said, what happened? Uh, Swami is going on. Then he looked at me and he said, uh, are you sure you want to hold it in your hand? Why don't you tie it to that uh, pole? So I said, Swami, it's a very small chandelier, you know, it is fine, I'll hold it like this, we'll finish it. Sareni Ishtam, and he went back. Okay, your wish. So then, uh, second time he came, we were still in the process of building. Once again he came, he looked at me, and he said, Adidaniki, if you tie it to that pole, I think it is better, isn't it? I said, Swami, it's almost over, it will get more time, you know, to hold it. I will hold it in my hand, it is okay. Nishtam, again he went back. Third time when he came, it was ready. Then Swami looked around and he said, Ah, switch away in Put on the switch and uh, the chandelier lit up and I also lit up with the chandelier. The reason was some earthing problem was there and that rod was getting electrocuted and through which I was getting electrocuted. So I was uh, dancing with the chandelier like this. Mr. Chiranjira was there. He was looking at me like this. What is wrong with this fellow? Dilip was looking at me. What is wrong with this fellow? Swami collapsed on a chair laughing. He understood what is happening. I was dancing like this all the while with the chandelier in my hand and Swami was laughing and then he got up and he told Dilip, switch you, switch you. He was not even able to get words out of his mouth. He was having such a hearty laugh. Switch you, switch you, he said. So Dilip was sharp enough, he switched off this, this thing. I just handed the chandelier to him and I fell off. I still saved the chandelier. Then Swami said, after I had sufficiently regained my breath, the parting shot was still not over. He came to me, put his hand on my shoulder and said, Bangaru, next time when I tell you something, you better listen to it. <laughs> Look at the wording, next time, means I am sure to make the same mistake again, sometime. If I tell you something, he is going to tell me once again, you better listen, there is every chance I am not going to listen, that means. So, but still, does that mean that he is going to stop telling us? No. He will continue to tell us. That is why we call him the loving mother. How many ever times we fall, how many ever times we falter, how many ever times we say, I don't need your advice to him. He still comes after us because his careful eye is always watching for our welfare. He doesn't mind taking a uh, here hit here and there. Uh, he has no ego whatsoever. So he doesn't mind taking these things from us as long as he knows that it's going to help. So, uh, I'm not sure how much time I still have. Okay. This is the power of his words, which uh, I'd like to share one more incident. Many times, I don't know, some of the people here may have experienced it. Something he tells doesn't make sense. And you know, we settle down and we try to use our logic and try to understand, you know, why did he say this, why did he say that and all that. Once again, Dr. Gangadhar Shastri and myself, we had gone to Brindavan. Swami was there in Thrai Brindavan in those days. So, whenever some work was there, faculty members would go from Puttaparthi in the morning. They would start from uh, Puttaparthi. And evening at 4 o'clock to 4.30, Swami would come for darshan. And after doing that darshan, there would be some kind of a Thrai session. And generally, the faculty members would leave after that session is over. That would be at 6 o'clock. This was at 4.30. Swami suddenly came for darshan, saw both of us. He said, oh, take namaskar and go right now. We said, why now? Nobody leaves at 4.30, you know, we'll go at 6 o'clock. So both of us continued sitting there. Swami was going on staring at us while the bhajan was going on, you know. And once he also told like this, still we didn't get the hint. We continued sitting there. Then finally, he said, enough is enough. A direct slap on the neck is the only thing they will understand. So he came out and he said, I told you to go, why are you still sitting here? So we went outside, it was 5 o'clock. But the driver, thinking that we are going to leave only at 6, was not there. So by the time we left, it was again 5.30. And at Gorantla, in those days, the road was very narrow and lots of robberies used to take place. At Gorantla, we were attacked by a group of robbers. Mr. Gangadhar Shastri didn't know what to do, so he just moved the window of the thing back and the person who was standing there, he just told him, you know, this is Sai Baba's college vehicle and we are his students and faculty members. Uh, we are going back to Puttaparthi. We are Sai Baba's students and faculty members. So that man just stepped back and he called all the others back and he said, Ellen sir, means you carry on, nobody is going to do anything to you. 
and we went away so next sunday when we went again swami was in three session was going on and he had asked me to give a talk so when i gave a talk i told this and he gave me a whack at the back and he said if you would have listened to me i would not have needed to come all the way to save you fellows this is what happens when you don't listen to me okay so the, the, that is the power of his words it is no different from him but like i was rightly telling you just because we decide to ignore his words he still doesn't ignore us he is always there watching us and he is guarding us i would like to conclude with uh, one last section that is this is some question which uh, i understand especially lots of devotees are grappling with at this point of time uh, what do we do now that swami's physical form is not available with us it is my humble opinion there is nothing new that we need to do there is nothing new that we need to do we just have to do with more vigor what swami has always wanted us to do maybe it is time to give that word of swami its due respect when the second year postgraduate students were leaving the campus swami used to give them an interview in those days once again so during that interview some of us we asked swami swami you have taught us so much during our stay here and uh, what can we do to change the world using those teachings the swami said don't even attempt changing the world you will not succeed that is avatar's job that is why the avatar comes so shouldn't we change the world shouldn't we help in changing in the world then swami explained further he said you stand as an ideal you stand as an ideal so that at least two others will be inspired to follow you that is all you need to do with me love all and serve all love all and you serve all you become an ideal so two others will get inspired to follow you that's more than enough gift that you can give me this love all and serve all is a concept uh, both of which i can try to explain with some incident you do the samuel sandwich's book with love man is god there is a brilliant story behind this i don't know whether uh, mr sandwich has already told it to everybody but uh, he narrated it to us students when samuel sandwich comes from the western atmosphere where the concept of god is treated with a little bit of uh, uh, i don't know what you would call it strange uh, panic strange kind of a panic nobody wants to talk about god directly no they don't want to talk about god directly for example mr samuel sandwich was telling us uh, when he wrote the book he didn't know what to title it in his heart of hearts he was getting that feel i should title this book man is god man is god but he said in the country where i come from that would be considered as blasphemy what do you mean blasphemy he said he said for example if my colleague came and asked me hi sam i when did you come back from india i came back yesterday what did you learn i learned that i am god and that uh, that person will start running away from sandwich and sandwich if he says stop stop wait i learned that even you are god that person will run faster so the concept of god is something totally alien he is there in a church every sunday we go and pray to him the concept of hinduism he is in a temple once in a while on festival days we go and pray him the concept in muslims we pray to allah he is formless each religion has its own concept of god but every religion at the end of the day if you read between the lines will tell you you are the actual embodiment of walking god we are his greatest form of creations so that concept when we forget we land into trouble so mr sandwich was very confused dr sandwich how do i name it but he said there's no alternative i leave it to swami let swami decide how do i label this book as so he went to darshan and swami took and he said swami please give your autograph on this book and he gave the book swami autographed it gave it back to him and when so dr sandwich went back to his room it hit him with a blinding light swami had given the perfect name for the book without disturbing anybody or anybody's sentiments you know when swami autographs a photograph what he writes with love sri satya sai baba okay now with love had come above the title man is god sri satya sai had come below so the title now read with love man is god with love man is god in one shot swami had told him 
what makes man a man and what makes man a god so the day we have that love within us it can be expressed in different forms each one of us has to decide to what extent we can express that love and taste that love but i do would like to conclude with one uh, important uh, incident that uh, happened of what sanctity swami asserts with the concept of service it was the vice chancellor's conference last night we had a video show in fact uh, i was telling a few of my student brothers see the where that took place and who was who and you know some of old familiar faces were there so we were pointing out i was fortunate enough to be a part of that and uh, during the vice chancellor's conference the keynote speakers of the conference were put in where the current sai shrinivasa guest house is there that was actually an old guest house it was prepared for the then president of india mr zail singh because he was due to come to puttaparthi he passed away before he could come so that was used as vip guest house and these eight keynote speakers were put up there so swami selected two of us with dr jagan mohan rao he was one gem of a teacher one reason why many of us imbibed several qualities was of course that swami was there but also because swami gave us some excellent teachers so dr jagan mohan rao and two of us were assigned that part it was isolated totally so one day morning we were working and suddenly news reached us that swami had gone to punchendra auditorium and he had called all the students who were associated with this vice chancellor's conference there were about seven of us and the four teachers to punchendra auditorium because he was giving them an interview both of us went to dr jagan mohan rao and said sir swami is giving an interview let us also go and dr jagan mohan rao said swami has trusted us to ensure that there is no lacuna for the visitors there is so much of work pending here and this evening onwards that the people are going to start coming i don't think swami will expect us to let him down let us finish the work if swami is still giving an interview at that time and if he is it is his desire and will that we come he will still be giving an interview by the time we finish our work he sold it so lovingly that we didn't feel hurt we said yes work is more important let us stay here and finish our work of course it took a very long time and swami went away we missed the interview and uh, we were just working evening bhajans were going on close to aarti time at 6:30 all of a sudden there was a big furore outside the guest house seva dal started running and says swami is coming swami is coming 6 20 25 in the evening swami coming we said it's not possible and soon enough suddenly the car stopped swami walked in there was nobody with him there was nobody with him so just three of us were inside swami pulled a normal even these kind of plastic chairs were not there folding iron chairs he just pulled one sat on it and we three of us sat around him and he spent some about 5 to 10 minutes with us and uh, then he blessed us and he was about to go now comes the crux he asked us do you know why i came at this time of the day so we thought that swami guests are going to start coming from tomorrow so you must have wanted to see the arrangements are pakka or not these are all the very important guests who are coming here we just kept quiet basically you know we were happy that swami had come and swami told us morning i was giving an uh, interview to the students and faculty members i saw all three of you are missing i was told that you were busy working here morning you couldn't come to me see bangaru so evening i came to you that is the sense of service which swami expects from us and the day we do it as a worship wherever we are swami will come there one last incident in my life before i would like to take leave uh, those of us who are at uh, satsai university will know that every laboratory and library that was built there was inaugurated by bhagwan except my nuclear physics laboratory swami never came there so i used to always pressurize swami write letters you know swami you came to every laboratory once you come to this nuclear physics laboratory and bless it no why don't you come to my laboratory and bless swami would not even take the letters so one night i was doing an experiment nuclear physics experiments when they are running for five continuous days we have to monitor several critical parameters so that there are no leaks of water or of radiation or whatever it is so i used to sleep in the laboratory special permission was given to me because uh, we had to monitor all the time and i would take down the readings i just the parameters go and sleep outside the laboratory because it is very cold inside so i used to sleep outside the laboratory every 3 hours i would get up check the readings go back and sleep 2 o'clock at night i had got up i had taken the readings and i went to sleep suddenly in about 10 minutes time 
like a madman i just jumped out of the table on which i was sleeping i i still don't know why i did that i just jumped up rushed into my laboratory and in front of me i saw the disaster unfolding the pressure was for some reason building up inside the water cooling tube and that tube was just coming out like that right in front of my eye i could do nothing i was stunned and before i could react that tube just burst out like that and the entire laboratory started spewing with water there was expensive equipment there was electrical wiring i just saw like this and i rushed into the pool of water and i got electrocuted there for some reason i think uh, swami chose electricity as a one very important tool to teach many lessons to me but i don't know whether i am because i am a physicist or what but i started getting electrocuted again i should have died by all reasons there was not a single soul anywhere it was 2:15 at night you wouldn't expect anybody to be around nobody was there to watch and once those of you who had the bitter experience of getting an electric shock will know you are numbed you can't react you can't react i didn't even have time to shout swami save me i was just getting electrocuted for i don't know for how long when some kind of a force which actually brought me out of my sleep gave me a very thorough push and i landed at the door away from the water and electricity i recovered my this thing went running around took a long bamboo pole and switched off the main and then at 3:30 in the morning i went to the staff quarters to wake up my supervisor and i told him that poor man came running at that time of the night and uh, at least he was happy he said so let the experiment go at least i'm happy you are safe he was also sure you know, that swami had saved me so then during the vacation time this is during the vacation time when swami was at bindavan swami jogarao colonel jogarao had come because some construction work was going on he came to puttaparthi to supervise it and uh, one more student had come with him so that night he came to the hostel and he said can you come out swami has sent a message for you so i came out and he said uh, swami wants you to be careful when you are handling electrical equipment it's like the statutory warning electrical shock please be careful i said uh, yeah i know that but why he said uh, it seems in your laboratory you got a shock so swami wants you to be careful you should be very careful about it i said please thanks swami this is really very illuminating thing for me it didn't end there when i went to brindavan the following week swami asked me to speak in the tri session i spoke and i narrated this and i said this is how swami saved me and then swami said every time you tell me you come to my lab you come to my lab you come to my lab when did i leave that lab for you for me to come back there again when did i leave that lab that you keep calling me to come back again to that laboratory because i always treated that laboratory as a gift a temple of bhagwan i worked my sincerely way whatever i did i did sincerely there and whatever i did i used to offer it as a dedication to bhagwan so swami converted that lab into a temple of his and that is why he was always there always watching me always guarding me i would like to part with this thought for today's uh, evening wherever we are let us carry a temple for swami with us wherever we are let us inspire two others to see us and see that this is a kind of person i would like to become that is perhaps the greatest need of the r the need of the r is not to ask what do we do because swami is no longer in his physical form whatever we need to do swami has already told us there's nothing new that has to be told there's nothing new he can possibly tell even the last 10 years of his avataric mission on this earth i don't think he gave a discourse last few years of his avataric mission why whatever he had to tell he had already told it is for us to follow how far we can follow let us have more such satsangs let us listen to each other let us experience each other's love our own mistakes our own successes and let us together become living temples that are walking in the society to inspire a far better world to emerge i would like to thank you all for your patient listening and most importantly my heartfelt gratitude to you bhagwan for making this possible it is one of the most exhilarating evenings that i have had for a long long time because every time i talk about this i am literally seeing swami sitting here in whose presence i am talking thank you very much and sairam Thank you.